as well. So the Picts. Um, yeah, no worries. That's fine. So the Picts, you should all uh, be familiar with us already, not least from, I'm sure, Gordon's books, which are just flying off the shelves. Um, the Picts were a confederation of, <laughs> of, uh, of tribes, early kingdoms um, in late Iron Age and early medieval Northeast Scotland, largely found uh, between the third to the seventh centuries, or slightly later. And as you know, uh, Gordon and others at the University of Aberdeen have been doing a lot of work over the last oh, um, five or more years um, with a major focused research initiative on the Picts. And through that work, we're getting a really good picture of um, an emerging picture of well-connected elite centers of power and densely occupied forts. And I think there's many online talks where you could listen to Gordon expound on these things. And um, we still know, uh, despite all the wonderful things that we're finding out, we still know relatively little about the origins of the Picts and also about Pictish sort of life. So sort of day-to-day -day experiences of people on the ground, which is the sort of the area of archeology span that I'm more interested in. So um, a bit of a disclaimer here, my background um, isn't the Picts. Um, I started out, so my PhD was focused on uh, Paleolithic material and um, before that, I was working on Bronze Age material and even some Roman material. I'm what's known as a, was more of a method specialist in archaeology, and stabilized tape analysis is one of my favorite methods, but I have other types of scientific approaches as well to help to unearth these kinds of aspects of life in the past. So what people ate, um, where they came from, what they fed their animals, um, and other aspects of how they, um, uh, how they subsisted. And with that background in mind, when I learned about um, the wonderful things that people were, were learning about the Picts in Aberdeen and about fascinating archaeology of the Picts, um, I, of course, lent towards these questions. So as well as the who were the Picts, which are what my friends who are focusing on the genetics of the Picts, which is something that we're looking at in Aberdeen right now, the, uh, a paper on the Pictish, Pictish genome is a way to be published quite soon. That's a big spoiler, um, which is exciting. Um, we we're also really interested in things like the diet of the Picts. So what were people eating? What was their subsistence base like? So what was their economy like? Um, and what about other aspects of their social organization and their uh, lifetime ability? And scientific techniques, so including isotope analysis, which I'm gonna tell you about today, and then also radiocarbon dating. So a lot of the work that uh, Juliet Mitchell's been doing. Um, and then, of course, ancient DNA analysis are beginning to answer some of these questions. So there's a kind of a, um, if you like, a team of us who are more interested in these bioarchaeological aspects of the Picts who are at Aberdeen um, uh, getting involved in, in some of these aspects of the project. So we have an ancient DNA specialist, myself, um, Edward, who works with Gordon, who some of you may know, who's a zoo archaeologist. And together, some of these questions are beginning to be answered. So the focus of the talk today, and I'll really happily talk to you, oh yeah, I'll really happily talk to you about diet um, afterwards, if you wish to, but I'm not really gonna focus on diet much at all. The real gist of this talk is gonna be about mobility, so about movement histories. Um, but as I said, because I've spoken about diet, not to you guys, but to others before, and I'll happily go over, go over that material uh, later on. Um, so why, why would any of us be interested in individual mobility in this time period. Well, I think it's it's just a, it's a historically elusive time period. Um, our knowledge is highly dependent on archeological investigations. But we what we do know, both from the archeology span and from some of the scant records, as you know, that aren't, they're not quite contemporaneous, they're slightly later. We know that it was quite a complex political landscape at the time. There was a lot of change occurring. Um, social cultural changes, religious changes were occurring in this period. We have, um, you know, evidence of mobility. So if we get evidence of interpersonal mobility, it could be highly informative of the kinds of cultural connections. It could allow us to test some of the ideas about um, connections between these different parts of the early medieval world. And we could also perhaps infer different practices. So for example, were uh, females more mobile than males? So you can begin to approach questions like that using these methods. And, um, and like I said, we have this backdrop of not only um, 
social cultural change, but also religious change at the time with Christianity spreading. So we've got reasons to believe that there should be sort of west to east connections at the time, should we say. So we've got an interesting backdrop to investigate, but not a lot of information about personal mobility. So my main questions are sort of what would individual life and mobility look like? What were movement histories like? How connected were communities? So how much were people getting around? And um, isotope analyses, uh, which is where, where I come into these questions, is a great way of investigating direct mobility patterns in individuals, um, in this case, early medieval. So the main isotope techniques we're using here, how many of you are familiar with isotopes? Can I do a bad show of hands? So yeah, that's good. About half the room are like, yeah, we know, that's good. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about strontium and oxygen isotopes predominantly. But as I said, we've done dietary studies as well on all of these, um, all of the cases that I'm going to talk about. And I'll be happy to discuss that afterwards as well. So strontium and oxygen, how these approaches work are um, strontium isotope approaches essentially are to do with the relationship between the strontium isotope signature of your teeth and bones and the strontium isotope signature of the plants and soils that you were um, living on when you were growing those tissues. So in the case of teeth, which form during childhood, so we all know we get our, we get our um, teeth during our childhood, they push up through our, our gums painfully during our childhood, but the periods of time that taking on their isotopic and chemical information, that's during a fixed period of time and then it stays. So your enamel, your tooth enamel is like a little um, time capsule of chemical information during that time period. And if people are eating locally produced foods, they are um, literally absorbing um, sort of strontium gets on board in the same way calcium does. So it kind of bunny hops into your, um, into your bio appetite in, in the guise uh, it's got a similar atomic radii to calcium, gets on board, it gets fixed in your tissues. And that's then related to the lithology that you grew up on. And you can see here, there's a, um, a, an ice escape is the word we use. Um, Jane Evans has been, she works in uh, down at BGS. She's done a fantastic job doing bioavailability studies all the way across Scotland. So galloping around her and um, Janet Montgomery spent a lot of time um, sampling soil, sampling plants, characterizing what different areas look like. It largely, any of you familiar with the geological map of Scotland will recognize that as being largely similar to a geological map. But the key thing is having these, um, sorry, I don't know why this is, this thing is, it's cutting off some things. Hopefully you're not missing too much. Um, but this is telling us the expected strontium isotope ratio of soils, therefore plants, and therefore animals, including people, that would be living in these different areas. So you can see some areas of Scotland have very high strontium isotope ratios, greater than um, 0.713 and some very low. And that's largely a function of the age of the underlying lithology and its compositions, its mineral composition. Um, now we don't just tend to, people don't just tend to like one isotope, we like two, because it's like you're um, cross-correlating two data points and you can kind of hone in on a more specific area, the more proxies that you use. And strontium is most commonly used with oxygen. So again, we're looking at, um, we're getting the oxygen isotope data out of the skeletons from the teeth. So we're picking a tooth that forms at a specific time in childhood, looking at the oxygen isotope ratios. Here, it's not to do with the geology, it's to do with the drinking water you consume at that time. And um, any of you are familiar with, uh, certainly in Scotland, it's fairly obvious that the West Coast is milder, often quite wetter, um, the Highlands, cooler, and that trend you see in weather patterns is then reflected in the isotope chemistry of rainfall as well. So we have more elevated values, so enriched, um, uh, enriched in the heavier isotope of oxygen in this coastline. And then as you go further inland, you get a quite a strong uh, west to east trend in isotope values in precipitation, so in rainfall. That then gets passed on to environmental waters, to groundwaters even. And there have been lots of uh, studies that have demonstrated how well these patterns hold true. And what you end up drink a local source of water, so environmental water, you eat foods, you look like 
where you're from. So you are not only what you eat, you are where you eat. And that is the underlying principle behind how this approach works. And as I said, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here because these ice escapes have been created by you know, rigorous and detailed um, studies of bioavailability, people sampling waters across Scotland to characterize these patterns. We don't believe based on um, studies that have looked at diachronic change that we would expect this map to look very different in the early medieval period. If this was, um, I don't know, four million years ago, it might look quite different, but between now and the, high medieval, and the um, early medieval period, not so different. So this is a useful map that we can begin our exploration. And essentially what we're doing is taking individuals from um, say a site here. The first question you ask is, does it match what the local value is? So is it a local or not? And fundamentally that's, that's the, the, the big point that we can do with, the, with the, these isotope approaches. And then if not, where may they have come from? Now, the second thing, that's a little bit difficult. Um, I'm a fan of parsimony. So that's sort of uh, being uh, as, as stingy with elaboration as you can be in terms of, um, of where, uh, the, what's the most likely scenario? It might not be the most romantic scenario, but the most likely scenario. So generally, then you look for your closest match, right? You can get matches that might be all on the other side of the world, but that's less parsimony. Right. So isotopes of these types, very good at telling you someone's local or non-local or likely to be local or consistent with being local. The next leap is slightly harder. And it's, of course, depends on your on your lithological map and your ice escape, because if you had a country that was just um, split down the middle two is isotope zones, very straightforward, one or the other. But um, the geology of Scotland is a bit more interesting. Than that. So that's how the method works. So what we did um, when we were starting this project, sampling picked from um, museums and also working with commercial archaeology partners. So people, um, individuals and organizations who are excavating, finding picture cemeteries, contacting them, um, asking if we can work on the material. Like I said, there's sort of simultaneous programs of radiocarbon dating. Um, Juliet was leading a lot of this and also DNA analysis. That's Lena's there all geared up. Um, so some individuals we've sort of done all three analyses. I would say most of them have been directly dated. Some have been analyzed with DNA. We've now got, um, uh, to, we've had two PhD students who've been working on pictish DNA, one who's just started and one who's just finishing. And we've also been sampling these materials for their bone collagen. So that is the, um, the protein that you can extract from archaeological bone. And that largely is telling us about diet, which I'm not going to be talking too much about today, but we'll happily talk to you about later. And then taking tooth enamel from the second molar. Now the second molar, so that's your second select back teeth, the one next to your wisdom tooth, that forms, so the bit where it forms in your jaw mineralizes before it pushes up, that happens between the ages of about three to seven. So that's the period of life that we're looking at, which is why we're, we're calling this childhood origin. And the reason we pick that tooth is, is precisely because it forms at that earlier phase. It's after weaning, because weaning confuses all kinds of things isotopically when you're breastfeeding babies. It confuses a lot of stuff um, chemically. So we avoid earlier forming teeth and we avoid later forming teeth because people may already have made, um, say your wisdom teeth, you may already have moved before that's finished forming. So we, we take the M2 because it tends to be our best bet at capturing where you were in your childhood. So, um, Here's an example of the experience of going to a museum and sampling, pick. So I sampled at Inverness Museum. This was oh, way back in about 2015, something like that. And um, I went up there to sample picks from Ballantor. I also sampled Garbeg picked, but that date was um, uh, a bad date. I can talk to you about that later. Um, but uh, I was given five picks from Ballantor and a sheep as well, a sheep jaw that was found in one of the kists. And uh, this is the great thing about these methods. You know, if you're radiocarbon dating, isotopes, you get surprises. So these are the first dates. So where are they? Um, three of these, these Ballantor burials, blah, 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 blah. Nice, what, mid, uh, first, cent, uh, first millennium there. They're Pictish, Picts, pick, 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 Pictish sheep, <laughs> yay. Um, so uh, that turned out well. Well, a little surprise with the other two. Oof. Mid Neolithic. So, I, and you'll probably all be familiar with, these burials, um, kiss burials, uh, dating, dating one and saying it's, it's a prehistoric burial, saying it's definitively Pictish or not, very tricky. And in this case, it was a, a short kiss burial that was mid Neolithic. So it just goes to show you can get some really, um, uh, it, it's not necessarily always obvious how old something is just by looking at it. 
should we say, is why the retention of these materials in museums is important, their curation is important, and their reanalysis using, because um, these materials have never been dated, um, just goes to show how important it can be coming back decades later, because these were excavated in the, well, in the mid-80s, and you can get some real surprises. And that, that was great, because yeah, <laughs> um, less interesting if you're looking for pics, but fantastic if you're looking for some Neolithic people. And um, we were then able, we were very happy, because we were able to contribute to a study on um, Neolithic genetics. Um, and actually, the, the Balintor Neolithic individuals ended up contributing as a sort of baseline for helping to understand kinship in Neolithic tombs. So um, that data, it, even though they weren't picked, we, we weren't disappointed. And we were able to, to um, you know, make lemonade. So there has been some previous isotope work on the picks. Um, you mentioned Port Mahomet before. So Shirley Curtis Summers has done some great work on Pictish diet at Port Mahomet, um, which has, in addition to the monastic phase, a pre-monastic phase, which is comparable to the material that um, I'll be talking about today. And then there have been a few other studies as well, uh, a little bit published on diet at West Ness, Kilfeder, um, and um, Kirk Hill. I don't know why that's colored. Sorry, that shouldn't be. Um, but... Uh, we've greatly added to that. So all the ones in black are the sites that we've sampled as part of this bigger study. And we've now got more than 50 individuals from 17 different sites and lots of faunal samples as well, because faunal samples are very important when you're doing uh, Pictish dietary work. So in the broader study, we've got more than 50 individuals. And then of those 50 that we're doing dietary work on, a subset of them have been done for DNA and a subset have been done for strontium and oxygen. And the reason we don't do DNA and strontium and oxygen on everything is because <laughs> the dietary work is the cheapest type. Um, but so we've now got 29 human burials that have been sampled for strontium and oxygen. So that's, um, that's actually quite a, quite a large study, um, given the, uh, the sort of costs and efforts involved. So we have the largest sort of Pictish mobility data set so far. And today I'm going to take you through some of these case studies. So I'll first introduce you to this fine fellow, Blair Atoll Man. Um, so this, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this site. It's out at Bridge of Tilt, which is sort of a settlement um, contiguous with uh, Blair Atoll in Perthshire. And it was excavated originally by Perth Museum and Art Gallery in the 80s. And the remains have been held at Perth Museum and Art Gallery. And also there, they're sort of uh, have been back and forth on loan between the local museum there as well. And there continues to be a lot of interest in this burial locally. And um, I think there's quite a lot of local pride for Blair Atoll Man, a lot of local interest. The um, skeleton was radiocarbon dated to between 400 and 600 AD. And this was work that was done at the time. They know he's an older ad adult individual. The grave itself was east-west oriented um, and comprised of uh, at least 20 different stones. You can see here, it has it features this unusual, um, su what's called a pseudo cairn stone. Um, so Mark at Perth Museum has, has written fairly extensively on these things. And we do, in the paper that, I, that we've written on this, we discuss this a little bit. They're quite unusual to find. It, um, well, they're... Um, common archaeological finds in like late Iron Age and early medieval Scotland, it's rare for them to be incorporated into burials. There are other examples. And um, it's an interesting talking point. Why, you know, is this just, oh, it's a conveniently shaped stone? By pseudo uh, cairn stone, I mean, it's a, it's a um, that, that's spelt wrong, isn't it? Sorry, that says cairn stone. That's just a quern stone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting my cairns and my querns mixed up. Um, at quern as in what you grind. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. You're all thinking, well, uh, looks like a real cairn stone. Well, it's a real cairn stone, but a pseudo quern stone. And um, so it's not being used before and it's fashioned in the form of a quern stone, but it's not a functioning quern stone, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah. Uh, there's, you can say, well, it's a convenient and interesting stone. Let's bung it in there. It's serving a purpose. You could get all, oh, well, it's to do with, I don't know, um, the harvest and renewal and birth and spring and death. And it's all, you know, so you, you can interpret this in, in all the lovely ways archaeologists would like to interpret that. But we write a little bit about that in the paper. And uh, Mark Hall's um, got uh, further expounds on, on this as a feature of burials. So that's an interesting feature of the burials. Um, like I said, is a male. 
uh, I love how they say like an older male and it's sort of 45 plus. So, um, but anyway, that's what that's all um, osteoarchaeologists can say. Uh, aging after sort of you reach full adulthood is tricky. Uh, about 5'10", uh, pronounced muscle attachment. So they can, can uh, they uh, concluded that he had a fairly active lifestyle. Um, I'm not sure whether this would still hold true, but apparently he had a molar abscess. So they mentioned that possibly had died of septicemia, but I, I think that's probably a bit of a stretch. Um, but he certainly had a molar abscess. Um, interestingly, he's a single inhumation, but if you look um, into the, you know, the statistical account, I don't know if you're familiar with those, a fascinating read, um, there is some historically documented evidence, including that of local short kiss burials. So maybe he was part of a bigger funereal landscape at that time or a bigger site, but sadly all by himself now. So, as I said, there's a lot of, um, you know, local interest in this burial. He's uh, been a, a source of local pride and he featured in the local museum for quite some years before he was relocated to Perth. And um, recent advances in archaeological science approaches have, um, have uh, um, inspired a sort of reinvestigation, a, a, a collaboration between community and commercial archaeologists, along with museums and universities, to learn more about this guy. And so this includes this fantastic uh, facial reconstruction. This is a 2D facial reconstruction, and I'll show you now the video, which is the 3D, which is pretty cool. Hopefully this works. Oh, this isn't my work, so this is um, uh, Haley Fisher's work. He looks like the Simpsons then, I think. Sorry, when the muzzle goes on, but... <laughs> Fab, isn't it? And there we have him. Yeah, and then it gets creepy, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Amazing, though. There you go. So, face to face with. So amazing facial reconstructions, and um, there's also genetic analysis, although I can't really talk about that because I honestly don't know anything about it. I know it's being undertaken as part of the um, Ancient People's DNA Project at Harvard, but I don't know. Um, I haven't had any update from it. And then isotope analysis, which I do know about. So what can I tell you about the origins of Blair Atoll Man? Well, we analyzed his permanent second molar, displaying his childhood origins, and he had elevated strontium isotope ratios, indicating an older lithology than where the site is. What was weird, though, was that his oxygen isotope ratios were enriched in the lighter isotopes. You know, I told you about those lower values being, no, sorry, higher. I always get confused because it's negative numbers. The higher values, so the enriched values, the more negative, the less negative values being in the West. So this was where we had a bit of a surprise. So we had an individual on older lithology, but probably not of local origin, but instead from a more westerly area of Scotland or even possibly further west. Because what's missing from this map is, of course, the big island, called island, which is right here and would share indeed some of these values. So what we conclude in that paper is that um, the sort of most parsimonious interpretation, so the closest, we'd be looking at Isles of the Inner Hebrides, but potentially further afield, including somewhere like Ireland, could feature as origins for this individual. And this is very exciting. This is, you know, evidence of immigration of an individual from Western Scotland or even Ireland to Central Scotland. You know, and this is an area that's literally written about in Columba, which is amazing. Um, um, so this is evidence of considerable personal ability during a period of socio, cultural and religious change. And uh, this is why you don't talk to the press ever, Irish missionary. But anyway, <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> but anyway, um, I love it how male with strong jawline in quotes. <laughs> but anyway, um, for me, what's interesting here is not. Yes, we can speculate. This is this is a, a fantastic direct link with either islands like Iona or, in fact, Ireland at a time when we know we have people coming over from that neck of the woods to do 
what is essentially missionary work or in fact um, sort of am ambassadorial type work you have to imagine as well lots of negotiations between people in power but for me this really highlights an interesting question which is that you know when we use the term picked we're conflating a person a pictured burial is somebody buried in a certain area at a certain time but this person was born somewhere that wasn't pickland so was he a picked should we use the term picked for him mm -hmm. um, but I think it just highlights that important thing of, um, you know, how we, we make those kind of, you know, what we mean and how we make those kind of cultural, um, what's the word, um, subscribing something like that to an individual. So now I'll get to the man you've all been waiting for, this hunk, I think, um, Rose Markey Mam. So I, um, here's another fantastic facial reconstruction. I really, I really love them. I don't have the talent to do them, but I think they really help bring bring the past to life. So uh, certainly there are archaeologists who are critical of facial reconstructions, but I think they're fabulous. So Rose Markey Mann, um, you all know this. So <laughs> you can probably correct me when I get things wrong. But this is a another Pictish burial, um, and this is from um, the Black Isle near Inverness, where we are today. We're not far away today, are we? Not too far away, Ooh, just up the road. So as many of you know, this skeleton was discovered in a sea cave on the coast north of Inverness during 2016. Yes, excellent. Um, by the Rosemarkey Cave Project, which is a community archaeology project. I understand. So there was animal bone that was found, archaeological artifacts was found, and then a skeleton discovered in an alcove. You can see I've circled here where the individual was found. Now, specialists in Dundee, so these are the, are the osteoarchaeologists who looked at the skeleton to do things like age and sex, because that's, I just do the chemistry, that's out of my remit. They determined he was male um, in his late 30s, and radiocarbon dating, I think, had determined he died sometime between 430 and 630 AD. Uh, analysis of the bones determined that he was robust, that he was in good health at the time he died. And um, his skeletons showed no signs of sort of injuries or extensive wear during life. So uh, it's difficult to say really, but from uh, that kind of evidence, you include somebody didn't have a hard life as a field laborer or something like that, I think is the general gist. So he was unlikely to have been a sort of farmer or a, um, or a, uh, a soldier. He did not necessarily have a hard and labored life. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the mouse, but I don't know where it's gone. To get it onto the screen but it's oh my gosh it keeps oh my gosh I'm, I'm giving up there we go oh god i can't oh there it is there it is now it's in the right bit it's okay it's okay it's okay there we go however as you all know he certainly um despite his possibly pampered existence <laughs> um his ending certainly wasn't that pampered by all descriptions his, he showed um sustained um injuries he sustained massive injuries around his time of death. They were substantial and sustained. That's another nice picture of the skeleton there. And yeah, you'll all be familiar with this. The, um, the many deaths of Rosa Mikey Mann, as I like to say, he showed um, evidence of five separate severe facial and cranial traumas. And you, you will have all heard this before, but I'll go over it anyway, because it really is quite astounding. Um, apparently, these traumas were inflicted with some kind of cudgel or fighting stick, I understand is what is um, spoken about. Um, initial penetrating trauma to the right side of the mouth, breaking the teeth, causing him to swallow some teeth. A blow to the left side of the jaw, breaking the mandible. Contact fractures as he falls, possibly he's saying with rocks, maybe back of the cave. Whilst on the ground, an object driven through the, right tem through the temple region from left to right. Oh, I've lost my bit. Sorry, this is really hard to read on here. And then a final blow after death, causing massive fracturing, breaking the top of the skull open. And you'll have, all, all be familiar with the, um, with what has been speculated around the nature of this death. You know, the classic archaeological it's ritual, right? Because um, especially that final injury, um, this idea of letting spirits out after death. Um, I don't know. What what is the what's the general feeling here about? Is this uh, ritual sacrifice, or is this a, a brutal murder gone bad? 
Do we do a show of hands? <laughs> no, everyone's just shrugging. Well, I mean, don't ask me, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not the osteoarchaeologist. No, good, oh, good, okay. Um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's very interesting. I mean, you, you can go the full whack of saying, well, it's a sea cave. Sea caves were liminal environments, you know, um, waterways connect one world to another, literally, figuratively. And um, this selected spot was deliberately chosen for this um, ritual sacrifice. You can go all the way down that end, and it makes sense. If you're going to do a sacrifice, you don't pick somebody scrawny who's almost dead anyway. You pick your, you send your finest forward, right? Like the bog bodies in Ireland, they're the second sons of kings or what have you. So you you do um, you do that if you want to make a meaningful sacrifice. Or yeah, some um, some bloke really caught a cropper, was mugged or something. They decided to get rid of him in a cave, cover him in dead animals because it takes the smell away, and weigh him down with a big boulder, stop him floating off. I I don't know. Jury's out. I, I I have no idea. You guys will have more opinions than me on that. What is interesting and where I can contribute though is his isotopes. Well, that's just to show his little head there and the big boulder. So his strontium, interestingly, his isotope values were within the local range. So he was a local lad, right? His oxygen isotope ratios match those locally predicted values. So his strontium and his oxygen have come together. Our crosshair is focused. What we can say from that is that doesn't exclude that he didn't come from somewhere else, but it's consistent with him being local. And that's how we have to word it. Because it's not like getting a postcode or a barcode or something. It gives you two evidence points. And if they match what you're expecting locally, that is consistent with being local. One thing that's interesting about Rosemarkey Man, though, and I'm not talking too much about this today, but in the kind of Pictish dietary landscape, he's most similar to a quite a fancy pants burial from London Lynx in terms of his dietary composition. And if we take that together with his general robusticity and the fact that he didn't have signs of having a really sort of um, <laughs> knackered and work-worn existence, we can maybe conclude he wasn't a nobody, right? Or that perhaps he was, um, he was um, somebody of perhaps some importance, but it's speculative. But what he was, was local as well. So a local lad. And there you go. And that's why when you say some sciencey things like that, and then it gets, yeah, then it gets turned into royalty because I said, <laughs> cause I said it was a high status diet again, the media. Um, so London links. Uh, this is uh, a site down in Fife. And it's the large, um, the largest Pictish um, era cemetery that's um, known in terms of the sort of body count, <laughs> as it were. Um, it's a cemetery with round and square cairns and long kists. And radiocarbon dates suggest that the cemetery was used between the fifth and seventh centuries. And importantly, in this case, it's, it's a, a secular site. So it's pre-monastic, it's pre-Christian. Um, so unlike the sort of later phases at Port Mahomet, this is giving us an insight into sort of um, Pictish society unrelated to um, monasticism and hopefully therefore a rare glimpse into Pictish lifeways. So there's a mixture of individual and um, sort of individual burials that are also known as satellite burials at the site. They're literally sort of uh, surrounding these burial complexes and then there are other complexes themselves. So there's, um, for example, the exclusively female horned complex called because it has these nice little horns. This is the dumbbell complex because it looks like a dumbbell. And the twin cairns, these are the sort of high status twin cairns. It's the male here. He has a sort of fancy polished disc um, as, as part of his cairn. They're the sort of most sort of finished burials at the site. And uh, yeah, uh, individuals who have, um, or the, the male at least, has, has quite a, a diet rich in um, pork and maybe freshwater protein, things like um, wildfowl and what have you as well. Um, and then we, yeah, we have a series of satellite burials as well. So there were 24 burials that were excavated in the late sixties, although it's worth noting that I think records going back to the 1800s show things, uh, skulls and bits and pieces being picked up by workmen eroding out of the beach. Um, it's sort of a, in a sand dune essentially and eroding out onto the beach berm. So there may even have been more burials than that, but they were the ones that were recorded at the time of the uh, excavation in the late 60s, early 70s. There's male and female burials. Interestingly, they're all adults. And this is largely, we were having this discussion at dinner, but there seems to be a feature of, of Pictish cemeteries in general. 
um, where you have cemeteries, especially if they're in this pre, pre-monastic, pre-Christian phase, you don't ever really have things like child size kissed, which is, which is interesting in and of itself. It leads us to question, so who is being buried? Who is this representing? Where are all the other dead pigs? So if we're, is this just a kind of um, a segment of society? You know, is that representing the upper echelons, but not the everyday people? Were these people the same people making the shell middens out at Forby, for example? I imagine not. Um, but yeah, a little um, query about where are all the dead pigs and who are these dead pigs and are they representative of the Pictish population as a whole? Um, it's been speculated, given the period of use, that it was, um, I don't know if this word is ever used in the paper, but there's a, uh, some people have talked about a sort of dynastic aspect to it. So you have this period of use and whether there's um, sort of individuals at the site who are related through time. And this is something that Linus and, and one of his uh, grad students that we're looking at right now, so a grad student that we supervise together, we're bringing together the isotope evidence with genetic evidence, looking at relatedness in some of these, um, in some of these uh, burial complexes. So for example, the, uh, the horned complex, this one I mentioned before, they're all female, um, that some of them, it is, uh, a lot of them share a, a, a torus mandibularis, which is where you have an irregularity with your, you're lacking your back molars. So I think four of the burials in this complex share that. So there's been some speculation that because that can be genetic, but it can also not be genetic because it's a common, uh, it is a fairly common trait. Some people have speculated that, that might indicate that they're related. So that's the kind of question that we're hoping to approach with the DNA. And unfortunately, I, um, we've done, uh, we've got screening data for this, and we've got, I think, genetics, decent coverage from about eight of them. And we do have one high coverage genome from there, but um, not enough yet to look at the, uh, it's a case of data mining and the data mining hasn't been done. To look at the relatedness yet, but we're hopeful that we'll soon have answers to those questions. Um, Yeah, so they're, they're congenitally missing teeth, which uh, has, has inspired this idea that there may be a sort of dynastic aspect to some of the burials. So the mobility data, what do we have? So this is just to make it a little bit easier. Um, the oxygen here isn't, it, it's a different scale. This is the measured value rather than the drinking water. I hadn't converted it yet, but to make it easier, this is uh, essentially green is most likely to be local in terms of matches the best with the local origin. Because annoyingly, um, London Lynx is right on the cusp. You can see here from the map, it's right on the cusp of two different lithological areas. Um, it's on the green, but it's right next to the yellow. And again, parsimony dictates that we have to look for the nearest alternative place. So it's reasonable to say that anything within that remit of strontium could still be fairly local. This is as local as you can get, but this could be just down the road, if that makes sense. So. Um, it could equally be from over here or up here, but, and that's where our two isotopes come into play. So with the two isotopes in play together, we have a real clump of local individuals. What's very interesting is that high status fellow, LL6, local as you can get. Um, and he's one of the latest burials as well there, so it's a capstone burial. We haven't got enough dates yet to say this for certainty, but what was interesting was looking at some of the non-local burials and being some of the earliest burials. Kind of makes sense, right? If you've got sort of um, founding populations. We have that, yeah, but some of the later occurring burials are also incomers. So it's not that you've got a population moving and then staying and the later burials all being local. You've got evidence, um, some of the oldest and some of the most recent burials are incomers. Does that make sense? So this movement was continuing throughout the period of site use. And one thing we can do as well, although, hang on, is it on the map there? Yeah, one thing we can help to look at localness is the dentine. So here, I'm mostly talking about enamel, but when we sample the dentine, dentine, unlike enamel, it's poorly crystallized, it's got a less compact structure, and it essentially absorbs the strontium from the soil around it. So the, the in-life signature is overridden by contamination, but we can kind of use that to our advantage because we know that that bit of dentine, or it works for bone too, is acting like a sponge, absorbing the local signature and helping us to tell us what the local signature is. And that's why I've got the dentine on here. So to give us a, um, to give us a, a, a more refined idea of what that local value is. And it matches the predicted value, which is always reassuring, right? So this is our predicted local value. All that dentine's absorbed the local signature and matches it, 
all those local individuals. But then we've got some individuals who are outside of that um, outside of that area. And the most interesting thing for me here is this group of ladies. So these individuals are all from that horn complex. And they're coming from somewhere in Scotland that matches the strontiumisotope value, but is warmer again. So here we have, um, I think I'm, uh, I don't know if I have. Yeah, so this is looking like, I don't know if they come up here, the circles. Yeah, yeah, West Coast or even, or even further afield. So I like to refer to these as my, my West Coast wifeys. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of them, interestingly, the only grave good at the entire site is a thistle-headed pin, which is um, quite typical of sites on the West Coast and even in Ireland. So this is very speculative. I only learned about this recently, but there's some suggestion, and I think, she, I think the pin belongs with LL12, so this lady here. And what I find fascinating here is if, um, and material culture people know more about this than me, is that if this thistle-headed pin is more, more sort of um, a more common feature of West Coast sites in the period, we've got evidence of not only a biological link to the West Coast, but then a sort of a cultural and identity link, something that stayed with the person throughout their life, that was attached to their clothing, that ended up in their burial, that re reflected that personal origin, which I think is a really lovely, a lovely story. That's the thistle the pin there. So, um, in terms of pictish mobility, we've got men coming from the West Coast, we've got women coming from the West Coast, we've got some people going nowhere at all, and um, we seem to have quite a lot of connection, and certainly where we've got people coming from, um, Ireland and the West Coast seem to be strong contenders, um, which is very interesting. Now, just before I finish, I want to just dedicate a little bit of time to cows, because <laughs> it's not just about people. So some of you will be familiar with this site, Burghead. Um, it's a high status Pictish fort site, and it's famous for its Burghead bulls. I was shocked to learn that you know, back in the day, it wasn't just one bull carving. There were, there were tens of these things. So cows were, um, or bulls, clearly very important at Burghead for either literal or symbolic reasons. There's abundant skeletal remains. There's lots of evidence of, of culling and butchery. So here's a nice head smashed in cow. Um, Interestingly, older animals dominate the assemblage. So there's been thoughts that they could have been kept for dairying, that they could have been kept for traction. Um, but where are all these cows coming from? If you've been to Burghead, it's on a promontory. I don't think they were you know, at the center of the fort where there's unlikely to have been a dairy farm, right? So, so where are they all coming from? And um, can that teach us anything about, about Pictish um, culture? We actually started this, oh no. Hang on. Oh, oh no. Sorry, I have missed out a slide. <laughs> and it's the slide with the data on. So I'm just going to tell you about it. It's just a graph, but I can talk you through it. So of the cat, oh, this is awful. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, so we sampled teeth from six cows. Just six, right? We started with six, like I said, strontium expensive. And we were also interested in dairying and there's ways you can use oxygen isotopes to investigate dairying, but I won't go into that. So, but we, we targeted them for strontium too, because if you're investigating dairying, you want to make sure all your cows are local. Well, the shocker at Burghead was essentially, I can't believe this slide isn't there. I feel awful. I can probably dig it off my computer and show you it afterwards. Anyway, six of them, data, data came back and essentially none of them are local. Three of them bear a signature that's slightly cooler and older lithology, inland highland cows. Nice, okay, so you can get from Burghead to more inland areas quite readily. You know what, 20, 30, 40 miles, not so far. Highland coos, so three of our six highland cows. One of them, a local-ish signal in the strontium, a little bit warm in the oxygen, but okay, but the strontium concentration, which is something I haven't really talked about, absolutely sky high. And this is quite a common feature of animals and people that um, grow up on soils in, and there's certainly a feature of the Scottish islands that are enriched with marine shells. They're called macro soils, right? So that's evidence in that case of that individual. It can't be local because we don't have macro soils in that area, but we do have them just over the water in uh, Orkney, for example. So, and the strontium and oxygen were a match for Orkney. So we thought, oh, okay, cows from over the water, fair enough. One of the cows, um, the oxygen was lovely and warm again, so just like those West Coast picks. So a West Coast cow. 
And then another cow, and we did two teeth from this cow just to make sure, came up with a uh, strontium value that was quite old, so an older lithology, radiogenic value, and the oxygen too cold for the UK. So if I had the next slide, I would show you a map now of Europe. And that trend that you get across Scotland and England from those west coastally values, thanks to the Gulf Stream that keeps the west coast of Europe nice and toasty, gets gradually warmer and warmer. And the more continental you get into Europe, so places like the Baltic, Scandinavia, mean average annual values, the rainfall will be um, depleted, they'll be lower. And those values are essentially matching um, Scandinavia. So we have at least, in the six cows we looked at, three highland cows, one west coast cow, a possible island, as in Orkney Isle cow, and a Scandi cow. So we definitely want to do more work. Um, but what's fantastic about this data is, there's also another slide missing. I'm so, so sorry. Um, it was just basically a breakdown of that anyway. Um, what we're highlighting here, oh no, there isn't. It's just the graph that's missing. It's okay, this is my summary slide. So what we're showing here is that we've got evidence using the isotopes of the movement of early medieval individuals from diverse areas of Scotland, maybe further afield, places like Ireland. We've got evidence of this west to east coast connection. And that's nice because we know we have the movement of ideas at that point. We have Christianity coming in from that angle. We have what's written in the sort of scant historical sources, but here we have the movement of people occurring on the scale of individual lifetimes. And we're seeing that connection in males and in females. And this is just from the handful of sites we've looked at so far. Um, and what's really mad is that this, this connectivity, this kind of broader landscape of movement is also extending to animals. And in the case of Berg Head, we have animals coming on the hoof. So they're, they're, a, they're turning up alive because we know from the zoo archaeology that they're being killed at an older age but the 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 animals are being raised somewhere else and they're being brought to berg head and they're being brought for a purpose what that is we couldn't guess so is this trade is this gifting is this tribute um but what we're looking at is potentially very large catchment catchments of what we would call clientship or influence at that site of the berg head and we know we're you know, it's described often as a sort of naval base. And here we've got sort of naval scale connections all the way across um, the, uh, that North Atlantic, uh, uh, North North Sea, North Atlantic area. Okay, so sorry that that graph wasn't shown, but I can dig it out later. I was editing it on the train, so I expect I just accidentally deleted it, I'm sorry. Um, all of this work is not just me, it's lots of other people, um, Orshi and Javita especially in Aberdeen, but also all the, all the people who provide samples and talk and, um, and write with me and, and share ideas and, um, and thanks to you as well for listening and hopefully for your comments too, because I'm sure you'll have lots of ideas as well.